to your talk. Good morning, everybody. Thanks to, for the invitation to be here. Thanks to the organizers and all the tech support. It seems to be going very smoothly, so that's much appreciated. Um, yeah, so actually, I'm a professor at Towson University, which is in Baltimore, Maryland. And if Simon were on, he would know where I'm, what I'm talking about. Um, but I do spend also um, some time, usually every summer, as a senior research scholar at IASA in Austria. And for the last dozen years or so, have been the scientific coordinator of their Young Scientist Summer Program which I will give a quick plug about because any of you PhD students or uh, mentors of PhD students should know that um, we host this summer program which uh, really runs all summer, June to the end of August, which allows uh, PhD students to come to IASA and work with a IASA scientist um, and they can get funding from one of the national member uh, organizations of IASA. And the, the thing to keep in mind is the deadline for the coming summer is always around mid-January. So. Um, so, you know, by November, December, the call is open and you can apply for that. If anyone has any questions, you're, you're welcome to ask me about that at some point as well, too. Um, in fact, YAS is selling its 50th, celebrating its 50th anniversary this year. I have the little pin that says that, and it's the 45th anniversary of this Young Scientist Summer Program, so it's really been quite successful. Probably over 2,000 um, PhD students have gone through this in the 45 years. Since we're such a diverse crowd today, I thought I would say a little bit about my background. Um, I had a, a double major uh, for my bachelor's in physics and aeronautics, and I actually started an MS program in aeronautical engineering until I realized that mostly I would be working for defense contractors, and I really wanted to do something to make the world a better place rather than blowing it up. Um, that's not entirely true, but um, that's what it seemed like at the time. So I switched to environmental science, and with the focus on energy resources, bringing in my physics background that way, during that time, as many people uh, do in grad school, scour the libraries back when you were in shelves and finding stuff that was all next to each other. I thought that was great, right? So you just kept reading along the shelf, everything from systems ecology, ecological economics, and urban areas and complexity and so on. Um, and that led me then to a PhD in systems ecology, um, mostly focused on network methods uh, that are, um, allow for whole system analysis which is what I'm currently doing now, but really not with ecological systems, mostly with social economic ecological systems, um, a lot with urban metabolism, food energy, water nexus, regenerative economy, and so on. Um, um, since 2004, at Taos and I uh, have been teaching a course I created called Human Ecology and Sustainability, which sounds very fresh today, but actually back in 2004, there weren't too many courses um, with that title. And with, um, with that in the book that I found, which was from 2001, which is pretty good, um, Gerald Martin's Human Ecology book. And what he stresses in there and what I'm bringing to, I think, the perspective of this conference about human ecology is that what we're trying to do is trace the chain of effects and feedback through ecosystems and human societies, primarily to be able to anticipate long-range environmental consequences and hopefully avoid disastrous surprises along the way. Um, we can also generate new ideas for dealing with environmental problems and, in general, we want to make the world a better place, right? Maintain a livable and sustainable relationship with the environment. So that's kind of my um, underlying idea of what human ecology uh, is. Uh, I think one of the reasons why we're also here today, and we saw this in um, Partha's opening talk, was that um, we are at a point in time where human footprint is greater than carrying capacity. And I think we all know that. We all, um, at least everybody in this room, acknowledges that, that that's not a sustainable uh, way to do things. Um, it's not common knowledge, but one of the ways it's trying to get attention to this is the idea of overshoot day. And I'm not sure if you've heard of that, but overshoot day is the day at which we have now used the Earth's resources for that year. Ironically, it's tomorrow, so I guess I should have been asked to talk tomorrow. But anyways, uh, we have one more day to live it up, I guess, is the point. Um, notice the overshoot day has been, oh, I can do this now, right? I was looking forward to that. So cool. Um, overshoot day has been earlier and earlier throughout the year, uh, the last several decades. Actually, 1970 was the year that we were basically one Earth, the last year we were one Earth. And since then, we're now, you know, we heard a slightly different number earlier, but 1.6, 1.75 Earths. There was a slight decrease in 2020 because we used 8% less energy for travel because of COVID, but then it immediately jumped back again. So, um, you know, we didn't, we didn't build back better. We built back the way we did. And, and, and we know this because we can measure the ecological foot footprint on the planet through, through various measures, and we also know the, the basic biocapacity that the Earth can generate for us. Again, that was the discussion of the first 
on the first day that that's really the first principle of sustainability. If we're over that, we're not sustainable. I mean, it's, it's that simple. Um, another point that I try to, to bring in, into my talks is that, that I see the, the problems we're dealing with today is really symptoms of other, other deeper underlying issues. And, and cleaning up messes and treating symptoms is never also going to get us to where we need to go. And there's a deeper flawed relationship, I would say, that we have with nature and also with ourselves that, that leads to us continuing to make problems and make these symptoms rather than, than addressing them at the source. Another way of looking at that is that the problems that we have today were actually solutions to yesterday's problems. Almost invariably, the messes we're cleaning up today were thought to be good ideas a few generations ago or a few decades ago. And, and I'm afraid we're going to do the same thing going forward unless we change this fundamental relationship that we have with nature and with ourselves. And one of those is, um, I think, very um, eloquently put uh, by Wendell Berry, who is a poet and, and wonderful author and farmer. And, and it's just like this, that we don't understand the word environment very well. We don't understand. We use it wrong. And, and he's saying the, the concept of country or homeland, dwelling place, becomes simplified as the environment. That what surrounds us. And once we see our place as surrounding us, we've already made a profound division between it and ourselves. We've given up the understanding and dropped it out of our language, and so therefore out of our thought. That we and our country create one another, depend on one another, and are literally part of one another. That our land passes in and out of our bodies as our bodies pass in and out of our land. That we and our land are part of one another, so we who are all living neighbors here, human, plant, and animal, are part of one another. Um, I mean, it sounds, it sounds almost like, sure, we all know that, but I think we forget that, and, and, and not to pick on anything, but it, one of the earlier talks also, the, the word abiotic was used, I think it was Pablo's talk, sorry, Pablo, um, in your social ecological diagram, I was going to ask a question about this. You mentioned abiotic, and a lot of people think about abiotic parameters as temperature and soil pH and, and rainfall, and those are all affected by life on this planet. They're not without life. Abiotic means without life. Um, so I'm trying to push this new term conbiotic, because basically everything on, on our living planet is affected by life. And, and when we create words and use words like abiotic, it, it, it generates a separation that is not, um, that is not right, is not there. And that also comes about from how we draw our system boundaries. So whatever system we make, we put the environment as that stuff outside of our system boundary. Okay, well that's convenient and, and we kind of have to do that, but one of the things that network analysis allows us to do is to make the node not within, uh, separate from the environment, but actually the center of two different environments. And so every object is receiving something from its environment and generating something out into its environment, which then allows us to ask questions about where it comes from and where it goes. And immediately you see that's a very different um, perspective on, on how we look at the world, because it's not fragmented from its environment, it's interconnected with its environment. Um, and then you can build up multiple of these, right? Each one of those nodes is connected to other ones. And so, so there's this theory out there called environ theory, which has been developed back uh, since the 1970s, and there's quite a few papers out there, which allows you to look at all these interactions, um, again, I would say in a more holistic sense. This is what my um, PhD work was on, and um, a lot of my early papers as well, too. And let me just give you one example from that. I know there's some network um, experts in the room, so this may be trivial for you. But, um, but just so we all have some, some firm basis. So this is a, a well-studied uh, ecosystem food web. It's uh, of an oyster reef model. So these six compartments represent different parts of the, the food web, starting with the filter feeders. Again, I can point there at that. And then there's detritus, and there's other parts of the, of the feeding chain. And maybe to make it look a little more pretty to see what's actually out there, it's, it's these kinds of species. And what we know from this diagram is the who eats who, right? where the energy is going. Um, in this case, what is it, uh, kilocalories, I think, per square meter per day. And so we can generate an adjacency matrix of the direct connections between each of those uh, compartments in that model. And, and one of the nice things about this, uh, the network approach is that we can take powers of the adjacency matrix, which will tell us the indirect pathways. So the A matrix was the, the direct pathways. A squared is the, the number of pathways between any two nodes that take um, two steps. So in this case, you see that between um, two and two, the diagonal or the, the self loops, uh, between two and two, there's exactly two, two pathways, two distinct pathways of two steps. Um, if you continue on that exercise, you see now there's four pathways of three steps between two and two, um, then seven pathways between two and two, and so on. And what you, what you notice when you do this exercise is how quickly, this isn't exponential growth, this is combinatorical growth. It's actually faster than exponential. 
So it doesn't take very far to go indirectly back into the matrix, into the network, to get huge numbers of distinct pathways. Um, we're into the hundreds if we take 10 steps, and if we even take 20 steps, we're already into the millions of different distinct pathways between two nodes in a very simple six compartment network. This is not a complex, I mean, it is a complex network, but it's not that complex, it's only six nodes, and yet we're having 1.5 million different pathways, unique distinct pathways to get from one node to another. So that's the complexity, I guess, uh, that emerges that we can then dive into and, and identify and, and track the influence of those pathways. So I'll come back to networks a little bit later, but I also wanted to point out then the, um, you know, w when you're thinking about the environment, it's also often useful to think about these, these major spheres that are out there. I would say not to partition them, but really for completeness to make sure that we're covering all of our bases and your system boundary should be including parts of each of those. But then, of course, recognizing the topic of human ecology, we can't leave humans out of that. The humans are the active integrator of the other spheres. We, we like to take stuff from one sphere and move it around to other ones. We're really good at that, right? So, so the, other, the, the spheres interact without us, as they had done before our presence here, but, but we're really good at, um, at accelerating and, um, and, and uh, embellishing those, those flows. Okay, now, th thank you also, those of you that spoke earlier, I can go through even quicker through some of this stuff. It's also the 50th anniversary of the Limits to Growth book, which I think was a very important, profound work um, in this field. We've already heard about that, so I won't go into that. Um, Luis showed us the picture of the Earth sunrise, or I'm sorry, yeah, Earth, Earth sunrise. Um, I actually prefer the blue marble when I talk about limits to growth, and this is it. This is the limits, right? This is the whole planet in one photo. A few years later, it was Apollo 17, not Apollo 8. So 1972, also the 50th anniversary, right? It's a confluence of 50th anniversaries. Limits to growth, blue marble, Yasa. Um, so anyways, this, in this one picture, and it did galvanize the environmental movement, as, as we heard earlier, to have people recognize that this is it. This is our spaceship flying through, through, uh, through space, and we better take care of it. So the problem with the, oh, I shouldn't say problem with the limit, the problem with how the Limits to Growth book was received was very negative, was very doom and gloom and very, um, they don't want to hear about that, especially economists and politicians don't want to hear that there's any kinds of limits. That was a, a, a poor selling point, I think, on that book, and maybe it was just the Times. But um, more recent work, such as that of Jane Jacobs, who's a very uh, influential systems thinker, has talked about limits, but she refers to limits as invitations to work along with them. I think that's a really nice way of looking at it, because sure, you, once you know the knowledge of the limit, then, then work with it, deal with it, you know, embrace it. Um, so so that, that spin is what we're looking for, and a few years ago, um, some co-authors and myself published a book called Flourishing Within Limits to Growth, which is the same idea, that yes, there are limits, um, but we can flourish within these limits. And, and our, our basis was following nature, because ecosystems do this all the time. They have to deal with their real-time solar energy constraints and other, other uh, resources, and they clearly flourish, right? The complexity, the diversity, the uh, information uh, uh, accumulation and so on. So, so trying to turn the tables on growth or limits to growth is not a bad thing. And I think that's the key message here. So um, one of the things that we did in that book was to talk about what are some of these properties that we can uh, observe in ecosystems. Um, and so we boiled it down into nine properties. I, I don't necessarily like lists because I know you always either forget one or, or have one too many or something, but we, we spent about a decade actually um, some, you know, my systems ecologist friends and I, um, but, but I, I doubt it's the final word, but, but we're, we're happy with it for the moment. The first three are basically what we've already heard today as far as the first and second laws of thermodynamics and, and the periodic table. Um, these are the two, I think, really interesting ones that sets biology apart from physics, is the, um, the fact that ecosystems use surplus energy to move further from thermodynamic equilibrium. Um, we refer to that as a physically driven biological aspect because it's something biology does, but with the physics around it. The second one is that ecosystems also can co-evolve and adapt and modify their environment, which is a biologically driven biological aspect. So that's also something that biology does that the physical systems don't do, um, but, but biologically, right? So anyways, I think those are the two key, and trying to understand those is um, still a lot of interesting work to be done. The last four properties have to do with just what we also observe, that there's a lot of diversity in nature, that there are a lot of networks out there, that there's hierarchies out there, and there's a lot of information. Um, so a lot of my research and interest now are trying to really understand these better 
and apply them to not just ecosystems but to social economic systems with the understanding that nature is sustainable as best as the best model we have for sustainability to date I think is, is nature and so maybe um, if we can design and, and organize our social economic systems along these that we would be better off. Um, yeah, I, I'll just go through these really quickly. Um, but as I said, the first one was that the, there's conservation of matter and energy. The first law of thermodynamics is quite useful. Second law, um, what, and a, a corollary of that is that there are no trash cans in nature, right? Everything ends up going somewhere. The, the matter is conserved. It gets reused over and over again through functional couplings. The second law um, is basically saying that all processes are dissipative. And the, the implication there is that these are all have to be open systems. And as open systems, they require a continuous inflow and through flow of energy, of new, new high quality energy driving them. So, so keeping in mind open systems is, is the important thing there, which drive all of the uh, biogeochemical cycles that we have. Um, yeah, interestingly, we've got 92 natural elements, but life uses about 25 of them and uses them in fairly much, pretty much the same way um, to, do, to do certain things. Um, you know, maybe in another planet, life could be different, but, but here it's organized around a certain um, similar bio, biochemistry. Um, all right, so then these were the other ones that I mentioned that really I think are the, the unique ones that, that, that things grow. Right? I mean, that's what's so cool about nature is that you, we take it for granted that, you know, at the beginning of the growing season, there's an empty field, and by the end of the growing season, there's corn stalks that are taller than we are. I mean, that's an amazing um, working against equilibrium process that's going on by converting sunlight into biomass. Um, and then the other one is the fact that we've got evolution, not just of the organism, but evolution of the organism environed. Um, complex. I, I think that uh, Gregory Bateson made a nice point about that we have the wrong unit of evolution, um, that it needs to include the environment as well, too. Um, yeah, networks, I had already talked about that that's a, you know, we do see networks everywhere. Um, hierarchies that are existing in nature, I think, is also well observed. So, um, now, why is that relevant to human ecology? And the point is, is that we all have to abide by these, nature and humans alike have to respect mass energy conservation, have only irreversible processes where work energy is lost, are open and need the input of work energy for maintenance, are, have hierarchies, have diversity, have networks, and have information. Where they differ, what we pointed out in the book, was that ecosystems are really much, much better at recycling than we are. And we're, I know there's efforts about circular economy and about improving that, but really the, the, the rates of cycling um, that, that human systems do is, is paltry compared to what needs to be done and what, what we see in nature. Another one is that this idea of growth is that ecosystems do take the surplus work energy and construct the biomass, as I mentioned in the, in the fields, um, and they increase the organizational complexities. And we clearly see that in human societies. But the, the problem and the challenge we have is that the energies that are driving that complexity aggradation are non-renewable energies. And so we're, we're in this trap that we're making more structure that needs to be supported, and yet we're doing it with energies that we know aren't going to be available to us in the, in the not so distant future. So, um, so although the same process is happening, the, the, the input um, vectors to those are, are quite a bit different. Um, this is an interesting point that, that um, you know, maybe we can unpack a little bit later, is that uh, you get economic rewards whether you're building or exploiting a gradient. So there's a lot of gradients out there that we can, that we can capitalize on, um, and the farmer is growing a gradient and then, uh, and then cutting it down and, and, and getting return from that. Other people just go out in the forest and cut down the trees, and they exploit those gradients without necessarily having to, uh, to grow it in the first place. So I think we need, our economic systems need to better um, differentiate between if you're actually building something or if you're just exploiting something. Um, and then there was also a very interesting talk earlier the, the, this week, too, about the difference between growth and development. And I think that's an important thing to point out is that ecosystems do both. They do grow. They do increase in biomass. But as I said earlier, they reach kind of a climax biomass. That, that old growth forest or that, that uh, savanna ecosystem is going to reach a, a, a based on the net primary production um, abilities of that region, it's, it's going to reach a, a limit of growth, but then it continues to develop information still continues to increase. There's, again, the, the, in terms of either genetic diversity or biochemical diversity or network diversity, and so there's a lot of development that takes place, place even um, past growth. 
Whereas, you know, I think that human societies are, are relying more on growth, focusing more on growth, and largely by just putting more into the system. You can always get the system bigger if you put more into the system in the first place. And that's a, that's a key difference between um, nature and humans. All right. Coming back to this idea of fragmentation that I mentioned and how we see the environment wrong, um, and, and I think that's what leads to the tragedy of the commons, because we see the environment, again, is, is out there. So we have this paradigm that we separate life from the environment in mind and action. Um, and then once it's fragmented, it's very easy to, to treat environment less than life, right? Because it's out there. We'll get to it later, but it's not, it's not part of the endogenous, you know, valuation that we have. And, and therefore, we consume and degrade the environment. I mean, it's almost a natural outcome of how we, how we view this. Um, and, and I said this is one, one kind of manifestation of tragedy of the commons. What we're promoting is, um, is a, a new paradigm for life, right? Something really simple. But the idea that um, we need a, a more internal, endogenous, recursive nature of nature, where we are defining a single life environment system and um, using a hyperset formulation, and this is more of a conceptual model, but life environment as one thing is environment at the macro scale, but within environment or ecosystems, within ecosystems or organisms, but again, within organisms is the environment, right? We're taking the environment all the time. We're made up of the environment. And by having environment both at the inner circle and at the outer circle, you can't ignore it. You, 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 you're gonna wanna be a little more protective of it, I would think. And then, then that could lead potentially to bounty of the commons, not a tragedy of the commons, but actually a win-win um, a, a situation. That's a little hokey to talk about win-win, but I think there's some, some good examples of, out there in nature. So I look at bounty of the commons as positive spillover effect, things that you weren't anticipating that happen that are really good for the system. And What's interesting is that is those network methodologies that I referred to earlier, we actually have a way of identifying the amount of network mutualism that exists in any complex network. And, um, and this is based on, the uh, again, those direct and indirect um, pathways that I referred to. So there's, we're going to use power series to get there. And as a result, what was interesting was that most of the ecosystems that we've studied um, actually have network mutualism. They have a net positive mutualistic interactions which is, um, I'll give you an example of that, and then I'll make the conclusion there. So coming back to our oyster reef model again, um, so there's the adjacency matrix. This is just the structure, and a lot of network analysis done just on the structure, and you can do a lot of interesting things about centrality and betweenness and connectivity. Um, most of the networks that we deal with are um, weighted digraphs, so we, don't, we know not just the structure, but we know the amount of flows between any two compartments. So I've, I've revealed now that this data set actually tells you how much is there, so instead of just an adjacency matrix, you actually have a flow matrix driven by inputs and also then receiving kind of final demand or outputs from, from, from that. Now, you can take that F matrix and do a lot more interesting things with it, I think, than you can with just the A matrix, and one of those is this uh, network analysis that talks about or reveals the, uh, the types of relations that you have. So, in the case of the oyster reef, the direct relations are always zero sum. Any two pairwise that you pull out, there's a winner and a loser. Something's gaining, something's losing. I mean, that's, that's nature in its, in its you know, basic sense, right? So you get zeros if they're not interacting. You, you read these the pairwise across the main diagonal. So there's zero, zero there, but there's a plus, minus there, plus, minus there. There's a minus, plus there. Um, but these are all pairwise as, as either plus, minus, minus, plus, or zero, zero. If you run the analysis and try to um, understand the, the impact of the indirect pathways, you get this as your final matrix. Well, a couple of things jump out right away. One is there are no zeros, right? It's the, the cliche of everything is connected to everything else actually shows up mathematically that everything is connected to everything else. And you see a lot of positive signs. Of the 36 possible signs in there, 25 of them are now positive, whereas before it was an equal number of positive and negative signs. So we would refer to this as new network mutualism because of the case that you have now more positive signs than negative signs. Um, and you see that because a lot of those zeros, those neutralisms, actually ended up becoming mutualism. Um, and in four of the five cases where there was no direct interaction, they were actually indirect mutualists with each other. So by being part of the network, they were helping another part of the network and getting help from it. In one case, they were, it was an indirect predation. Right? I mean, there's no guarantee it's gonna be mutualistic. It's, it is what it is. Um, but what's also interesting, 
Well, as I said, so this is really contrary to conventional wisdom, even the ecological literature. We're, we're kind of heretics there, too. Um, but, uh, but it's really full of mutualistic interactions. Sorry, uh, sure. Brian. Yes. So, so is this a, a property of this particular network, or is this a, proper, a generic property? I mean, if you rewire at random this network, would this property be maintained? So network mutualism is not guaranteed to happen, but it usually happens in the well-defined ecosystem networks that we have. In the ones that you observe in nature? Yes, so the, the, the data sets, there's, there's, I mean, some of the other network scientists here probably even know better than I do, but there's, there's a couple hundred really like high quality ecological networks that there's databases for. And, and the majority of those would, network. not random networks, okay. no. Yeah, these, these are um, from data from ecological systems. But I'm curious then, we're, we're applying this now to, to human systems, to trade networks or to um, economic systems, to um, uh, urban metabolism systems, and seeing, and we're finding a lot less mutualism actually in the human systems. That's actually another talk, but, but that's an interesting line of, of, of work with this. Brian, um, sorry, can you just quickly yes. repeat how you built the second matrix? Yes, so the second matrix is built by, um, so we, we, we take each pairwise interaction between the, the, in the direct sense, and we normalize that by the through flow of the node. So we know the flow values. So it's the net flow divided by the through flow to give a fractional exchange flow, and then take the power series to get the second order effects, third order effects, fourth order effects, and sum that infinite series. The, the series actually converges. So we get the effect of all the possible indirect pathways into a final matrix. And this is just the signs of that final matrix. So there's numbers behind there, but the numbers just kind of complicate things. So I'm just showing you the signs. Um, but yeah, thank you for that as well, too. One other point I wanted to make on this one, which is really anti-intuitive, is that sometimes the, uh, the, the direct relations actually will flip in the indirect sense. So here you had a predation, you know, a plus minus, but in the, in the integral one, it was a mutualism. So, so the, the ecologist that's out there measuring something in the field and measures an organism eating another organism is writing down that's a predation relation, and that's what they're w witnessing. But when you actually run the indirect influences, it, they're actually those two species or functional groups could be helping each other in this case. Or in this case, a predation actually ended up being competition. So the fact direct relations flip is really like, oh, wow, that's pretty cool, and, and something we should probably be paying attention to. But. Um, um, I don't know how I'm doing on time. I, 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 start, I meant to start mine, and I didn't. Five minutes, OK. Um, so this was just kind of a deep dive into some of the other mathematics that you can do with this. I was curious about whether the network pattern can say something about it. So if you have a, a, just a simple chain model, it turns out that the amount of mutualism that you have in your integral matrix um, depends on whether it's an even or odd chain, but in the limit, you get about three times as many positive signs as negative signs if you have just a chain. So actually, that's not so bad. I mean, we think linear systems are, 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 are um, not as useful, but still you're getting some mutualism out of there. But what's interesting is the, the system that has the most mutualism is a circle, is a, is a cycle. So um, again, you can run through the math here. And um, in, in the case of an infinite cycle, you actually get infinite um, mutualism. So, you, so, in fact, everybody is mutualistic with everybody except the one who's taking from you. But you're actually helping everybody else in the network because you're keeping the network going. So what comes around goes around, and you only have one negative interaction, and all the rest are positive. Again, pretty cool, right? Um, so what are some of these activities that can potentially alter the network patterns? If we're trying to look for network patterns that are um, more beneficial, then we've talked, heard talks already about fragmentation in terms of habitat loss and loss of diversity. And, and we know that these are, are taking away. We saw a very good one of how the change over time uh, um, from Stephanie about um, how much more simple the networks were becoming um, due, to, due to human uh, activities and intervention. So, so those networks are probably going to have much less mutualism um, than, they, than they would if they were more, more natural. Um, also, the fact that network, network mutualism is a positive externality. And another point that I'm just kind of toying with now and, and, and jumping onto is that we focus a lot on negative ex externalities. We want to reduce negative externalities. I actually think it's a bigger thing to do is to try to reinstate the positive externalities that were already out there in nature. There was a lot of positive spillover that got sniffed along the way. 
and, and we, we didn't realize that it was gone until it was gone, and now we've forgotten about it. We're trying to reduce the bad, but we're not trying to promote the good enough, um, if that makes sense. And that, that's more of a theoretical thing than, than a specific example, but maybe that makes sense. All right, so let me just then end with this, um, this idea of you know, the people, planet, prosperity, um, these pillars of sustainable development. I will do my quick note, though, that the nested hierarchy is really a much more accurate view of sustainability because, again, environment is everywhere, and society is a subset of environment, and economy is only a subset of, of economy, uh, of society. But still, I mean, if we've got these three main pillars of, um, of sustainable development, what, what I'm um, really interested in collaborating with the demographers in the room now is that historically, ecology was really the only discipline that dealt in cycles, that w was dealing with limits, that was dealing with carrying capacity constraints, it was dealing with the, the pulsing of cycles. Both human population was growing and the economy was growing, lockstep. They were both, they were, they were teammates together. And ecology was always the outside character in that, in that discussion. Uh, what interesting thing has happened, right? We're hearing from all the demographers that that's not the case anymore. The human population is now leveling off. So what does that mean? It means the economy is the outsider. So we, the demographers should team with ecologists and, and be on the same team and say, hey, we both got stable um, models, basically, stable, stable futures. How do we deal with that? And we, we heard earlier some of the problems. How do you deal with pensions? How do you deal with the, you know, one child uh, being spoiled or whatever um, as, you, as the population is reduced and, and financing that? But, but anyways, I, I think this is really encouraging that, um, that there, there can be much more concerted, coordinated effort with ecology and demography um, trying to, to work together with that. So that's why I think for future re research is realigning with the realignment of demography away from economics and the growth paradigm, but towards ecology with cycles and limits by adding environmental caring capacity to demographic models. We heard the question the very first day to the first demographer, um, where's ecology in your model? Same question I had. Um, how will e economics then respond to being the lonely discipline? Um, there are some economists here that maybe can help with that. And then, as I said, let's try to investigate um, more of the positive spillover benefits um, and the networks that, uh, and trying to reestablish those network connections. Um, another way to think about limits, which I really know that will have arrived there, is I love this quote, they are limits, let's celebrate the limits. Right, I mean, no, don't be afraid of limits, celebrate them. And, and, you know, when I hear Japan finally saying, yay, we got a stable population, then I'll know that we've arrived, that, that that's the right outcome. Not, oh, my God, it's a stable population. What are we going to do? What are we going to do? And that's, that's how it's treated now. Whenever we get close to a limit, there's kind of a freak out that goes on. So at the same time, we are confronted with uh, working against limits, right? So, um, okay, that's it. That was a picture I took at 6.30 this morning. Thank you very much for this interesting presentation. And now it's time for questions. Yeah. Thank you for your very thought-provoking talk. I have two related questions um, regarding the um, positive externalities. Mm. Uh, first, if, if, if your paradigm says that everything is connected mm -hmm. and there's no environment, What's the meaning of externality in this context? Uh, that's the first. Mm -hmm. And uh, the second is, if you could give concrete examples of positive externalities we need to reinforce. Yes, thank you. Um, way back at the beginning, maybe I could, I'm going the wrong way, aren't I? No, that should be going the wrong way. Um, everything is connected to everything else within your system model, and there still has to be a practical system boundary. I'm, I'm just trying to go back to where I, the very first time I, I showed the, the conceptual model of, of how we do sy systems, and it was second or third slide, so apologies for that. But um, yeah, so, so I, I didn't, uh, actually in, in the longer version of this talk, I have this model, but, I, but you, you, at some point you have to draw a system boundary around this. And we have the discussion like, oh, let's model the universe every time, and then it's like, no, that's a little bit too hard. So, so, the, so do you want to include all the major um, processes that you think are going to influence, but practically you do have to include a system boundary, right? So that, that's how we get around the, the fact in that sense. 
Um, positive, positive spillover, I, I think soil formation is a really good example of that. So as a, as a result of the organisms working together and doing their thing, they're aggrading soils and they're making richer, more organic soils, nutrient rich soils. And so as you start to snip away some of the activities, if you add too much pesticides and you're killing the, the microbial activity in the soils, um, you, you're losing that benefit. Um, and, and so you, you still might be able to get, you know, in the short term faster um, healthy, not healthier, but yeah, faster plants growing, but you're actually killing away this, this idea that soil formation was a natural part of the cycle before. Um, so for one example, you only asked for one, so yeah. Other questions? There's something from the... Fabio. You have one, Fabio? You, you showed the case of the oyster reef, yeah. and you found out that uh, eventually uh, it, uh, mutualism prevails yeah. over, over others. Um, could, would you say that this is a feature of all systems uh, that, that, that are stable? I mean, you can build a network, an ecosystem that does not have this property. Would you say that this ecosystem will eventually collapse or die? If there is no, so would you would you conjecture, if not prove, that um, a, a prevailing mutualism is a conditio sine qua non, this system can remain stable is as opposite to collapse? Yeah, I, w I wouldn't use the word stable, but I would say it might be evolutionarily selected for, and it might be it might be moving into that space where where that is the outcome. And so, um, yeah, I mean, that's, that's kind of the strong hypothesis that we're going by, is that the ones that, that exhibit mutualism and more mutualism are, are again, not necessarily maybe stable, but better systems. They're, they're functioning in a way, and, and it's what we observe in, in most natural ecosystems. And as I said, what's interesting is it's not what we're observing in most of the um, human uh, networks that we're looking at. But, um, but, yeah, so, I mean, I think you're, you're, you're thinking the same way we are about it is that there's, there's some features about those networks that are, um, that are inherently uh, moving in that direction, and then they will be selected for or be stable, if you want to use that. We can talk later. So thank you again, Brian. And uh, if there are no other questions, uh, we move to the coffee break, and we meet again at uh, 10 past 11. Thank you.